Hi, everyone. Welcome to Foresight Space Group, chaired by Kriya and Levitt. We're really excited today to have Alex Gilbert joining us. And Alex will be discussing lunar exploration and water mining with nuclear energy. Please take it away. I'll share more info about you in the chat and about your work. But yeah, we're trying to leave a lot of time for Q&A as well. So please hit the road. Perfect. Thanks so much uh, for joining. I'm really excited to talk today about lunar exploration and water mining. I'll hop right into it. But just as a brief background, I have two hats uh, that I wear. So one, I'm a fellow at the Pain Institute for Public Policy at the Colorado School of Mines and a PhD student there. Uh, my focus is on space resources, uh, but also uh, particularly focusing on space nuclear applications uh, in general, but for space resources. And then also, I am the director of space and planetary regulation at Xeno Power. Um, so Xeno Power is a commercial startup. We're developing commercial radioactive power sources, uh, which we'll be talking a little bit about today. So to start, what, why does this matter? What, what makes me so excited about this area is that right now we are on potentially the very beginning stages of a lunar resource rush in general, but particularly for water. Over the last 20 years, we've really found that a lot of initial hypotheses about having water resources on the moon have been verified. There's still a lot of uncertainties about it, but in the broader geopolitical context, a lot of things are happening right now. There is now a very significant push to go back to the moon. And it, this is a very different change than, say, the space race of the 1960s. So the way I'm thinking about this right now is I'm calling this the lunar inflection point. This is a little bit older chart that I made, but you can see that a lot of the initial exploration of the moon happened in the 1960s, uh, early 1970s, as part of the space age, the Apollo era. And we've had a long period of time where there has not been a lot happening. We started having some more activities in the late uh, 2000s. Uh, but because of some broader changes in the space industry, uh, we've had an inflection point over the last 24 months. So first of all, we had a bunch of different missions that have gone to the moon. At this point, I'm actually really losing track. We had India about six months ago successfully soft land on the moon. It became the fourth ever country to do so. That only held up for a little while, though, because Japan landed a couple months later and became the fifth country. And then we just had Intuit Machines, a private company, become the first ever commercial company to land on the moon. We also had a number of failures along the way. So we've had about three major lander missions that have failed in the last 24 months. Getting on the moon is hard. It's something that is the first challenge to be able to develop the moon. But when we're looking out uh, for the rest of the year, we still have eight or nine more major missions heading to the moon, potentially including the Artemis II uh, crewed flyby, the first time that humans will leave deep space since the end of the Apollo era. The Chinese are working on their potential lunar sample return from the south pole of the moon. So we have a lot of things that are happening right now, and that's very likely to accelerate. So this chart here, these are planned missions, but really these are manifested missions. Uh, we have a really rapid increase in activity that's going to be happening over the next several years, in large part because of water. Now, what has led to uh, this uh, moment in time? When we look at these type of broad trends, it's really important to recognize that these things are not because of one factor alone. Usually when you see something big, like a massive global push to go do something, because there's multiple factors that have happened. And I think there are really five major factors that are enabling this first lunar space age. First, the commercialization of outer space, as I'm sure many in this audience are aware of. We've seen significant changes in our ability to go to space. There's a much broader participation base that has led to falling costs. So that means that small universities, small companies, new countries can go for the first time. We have many new countries that are starting space programs and countries that are heading to the moon, either alone or in partnership. We also have global geopolitics that have been renewed. On, on the lunar side specifically, you have the United States has led the development of a multilateral accord, the Artemis Accord, which now has 35 some odd countries. It's growing every single week that are trying to develop shared norms of governance for how we go back to the moon. Same time, you also have China and Russia that developed the Air National Lunar Research Station, which I believe has seven or eight members right now. So you have a lot of the countries that want to go back to the moon that can go for the first time are also starting to sort into these shared coalitions and part tied to broader global geopolitics. And the last one I'm going to talk a bit about is that we actually have space nuclear technology developing and being able to be served to commercial solutions. So that's what's enabled this. But why are we going? And again, there's a bunch of different reasons that have the amount of investment and the level of interest that we are seeing and that we expect to continue to see. There needs to be multiple things. On the civil space side, we want to develop the same and sustainable presence. So human exploration, the Artemis program to actually land astronauts. We have a bunch of planetary science. We have other science like astrophysics or geophysics that want to use the, uh, the moon as a base for those observations. A lot of commercial development, which is going to be tied to the lunar water I'm talking about today. And also because there's this economic and civil interest in the moon, 
with the global geopolitical condition, there's also a security interest, both for the cis lunar environment, but also for how we do things in orbital space because of the tie of water. So where does water come from? Why is water so interesting? First of all, we do live on a water moon, uh, a water uh, planet. The Earth has a significant amount of water, but the Earth is a lot larger than the moon. And because of that, it has a much higher gravity. So getting to any location in space requires a lot more delta V. And because of how orbital dynamics work, the moon has settled on its axis in a different way than the Earth. So the Earth has the 23.5 tilt to its axis. That's what gives us our seasons. That's what uh, changes how long days take. If you uh, just had the time change, for example, that's why the time changes over the course of the year. The moon actually has a very limited axial tilt compared to the sun. It's about 1.5 degrees. And so that creates this really unique situation. And I'm gonna play this video. Um, this is the South Pole of the moon. And this is a really unique environment. There's only other couple other places in the solar system where this happens. But because you have that axial tilt, the north and the south poles of the moon have the sun coming in at a very low angle. And because you have different ridges, different craters, you have a lot of shadows. And if you look in particular at the very center of the screen, where it's outside of Shackleton, right where that cross comes together, you'll notice that some of those rims, actually, even with all the shadows, all these changes, all these day-night cycles, the moon has about a, a one-month lunar uh, day-night, those rims still have sunlight. Now, some of these areas, though, are also never seeing any sunlight. And so this is a really interesting thing that has been observed and really better understood. And that is particularly important when we look at this, which is taking all of that data in terms of just what does it look like and then figuring out how off is any particular area in sunlight. And what we have really realized and started to develop is what we call the peaks of eternal light idea. Those crater peaks have essentially unlimited sunshine. You're getting up to, in some cases, 90% of the time it's in sunlight. And that's really important because on the moon, most of the time it's about 50-50. And your lunar night lasts about two Earth weeks. Because you don't have an atmosphere, temperatures drop very quickly. They become very cold, in many cases, 100 degrees Kelvin or below. And that kills spacecraft. It freezes electronics. It causes all sorts of thermal stresses. You don't really have power sources from the sun. So even if you want to try and uh, do, say, like a thermal battery situation, you end up with a spacecraft that is 60, 75, 80 percent battery just so that you can uh, survive uh, overnight and so that your spacecraft doesn't die. And so if you're trying to have spacecraft survive on the moon and want to have a lot of access to solar, these very small areas are very attractive because you can always have at least some solar. Now, the solar is moving. Uh, you saw that last image with those really uh, stark shadows. And so you're going to have to constantly be following the sun with your solar system, or you have to make sure that you're orienting your panels correctly. Um, but this does offer an opportunity to have a fair bit of certainty without something like nuclear. Now, the other thing you'll notice here is that there's those dark regions. And this is the other really interesting thing about this axial tilt of the moon, is that these dark regions are what we call permanently shadowed regions. They do not see sun. Many of them have not seen sun for billions of years. And that allows them to actually collect volatiles in certain conditions. Now, the temperatures inside those craters can get really cold. The, the darkest areas, the deepest areas that don't have even reflected sunlight off a, a crater rim, for example, can get down to 15 to 30 degrees Kelvin. Many extreme volatiles like carbon dioxide or methane or some of the other things that we might be interested in actually freeze out there. And then in terms of water, we actually think can be in many of these dark locations uh, because it has a point that it freezes a lot uh, warmer than that. So these areas can freeze out water, and there are multiple potential sources of water, both from just the general lunar environment, from the solar wind, from comet and meteorite impacts over time. And we now understand that there actually is some level of water in accessible places in these permanently shadowed regions. Um, on the right, you'll see a, a recent study that was really thinking about how the axial tilt of the moon has changed over time and how that might influence the ability to build up water deposits. These are deposits that potentially could be just on the surface, a little frost, all the way down to several meters or more. The concentration's not going to be super huge. But you can see that especially those red areas have been essentially in permanent shadow for over 3 billion years. That means they have a lot of opportunity to accumulate water from each of those different sources. And there's been a bunch of different instruments, including some of those missions that uh, were, were in the earlier chart that started in the mid-2000s to the, the uh, mid-2010s. A lot of them were remote observation, but we actually do have ground for it. The LCROSS mission um, had an impactor. We're able to observe the plume of that impact. It was one of the 
darkest, coldest uh, parts of the permanently shadowed region. But based on that, we were able to observe that water in that specific sample, um, which hit about uh, three meters down, uh, about uh, two dozen meters wide, was about 5.6% of the total mass. That's pretty significant. Then you also look that there's a number of other things that are interesting there as well. I, I point in particular to the carbon dioxide and the methane, just because there isn't a lot of other carbon sources on the moon. There's not a lot of hydrogen in general on the moon. There is oxygen bound up in rock. But this is really exciting because this sudden that with just potentially a bit of heat, we can access that water and use it. Now, why do we want to use water? Again, we're on a water planet. Do we need to import it back here? No. We want to use water because it is composed of hydrogen and oxygen, which we can use electrolysis, so we can use other technologies to make rocket fuel. In the case of something like a methane ship, so say Starship, if we add carbon dioxide, we can completely refill those ships by having carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and their different constituents, put, make that into rocket fuel, and refuel things. And this is from uh, the commercial nuclear propellant architecture about five years ago that looked at what does this look like from an economic perspective? Because the moon doesn't have as much gravity as Earth, it's much more energetically favorable to get from the lunar surface to a certain spot in space than from the Earth's surface to that same spot. And this estimated that if you're able to actually develop a water mining infrastructure on the moon, in many cases, it's going to be a lot cheaper to refuel from the lunar surface. Now, if you go and land on the moon, it's almost a no-brainer. It's going to make a lot more sense to be able to refuel there instead of bring all of that down mass with you and launch all of that from Earth. But then if we actually even look closer to Earth, there's a lot of locations that even in low Earth orbit or in geostationary orbits, it can actually make more economic sense to refuel from water from the moon. And this is particularly important when we're talking about the Artemis program, because the two landers there, the human landing system, both Starship and then the Blue Moon lander, those require anywhere from 8 to 15 or so, the, the numbers are uh, not very well known publicly, launches of super heavy launch vehicles to refuel just to get to the moon. If you can cut down half of those, or if you can even just go ahead and send up one of those rockets, refill it in space, and then go to the moon, that definitely cuts down the cost of any of those missions. It also means that we could potentially do Mars transit much more easily. So every single time that we have, say, a Starship go up, instead of having 10 or 11 that need to go up and refill it, we can have one of it go up, get refilled, and go straight to Mars. Also, this whole refilling architecture is really valuable for all the satellites that we're starting to put up because of those broader changes in the new commercial space uh, industry. So how does space nuclear play into this? So space nuclear technologies, they've been around for a while. The, the three kind of branches of nuclear technologies that we think about are radioisotope, fission, and fusion. Fission is admittedly still very futuristic, but radioisotopes are something that we use consistently for space exploration. The, the Department of Energy and NASA develop plutonium-based radioisotope power systems. They're essentially like small nuclear batteries the size of, say, a microwave. And that allows you to go into deep space to be able to go to, say, places like Voy um, the, the giant planets with Voyager, Pluto with New Horizons. And we actually used uh, these systems historically on the moon with the Apollo program. Uh, we used them for both heat uh, to help survive that lunar night in those areas with that 14-day-long night, um, but also for power to be able to do multi-year-long missions to do scientific uh, exploration and studies. On the fission side, now fission is something that is what people usually think about when they hear nuclear. That's just splitting an atom, using that to create energy. In the case of a power plant, you then use that thermal energy to create electricity uh, with a turbine. And that power is about 20% of the United States, about 10% of the overall world. Those are very large systems. When we're looking at a space application, we're talking generally a lot smaller systems. And we actually have not seen as many fission systems used um, in the United States, at least, as we have for radioisotopes. So why go to nuclear at all when we have these different technologies? This chart on the right, it's long adapted from NASA. Um, it's, I think, a really good kind of way to just represent that. If you're looking at any major thing in space other than propulsion, you're going to be either using solar or you're going to be using nuclear. Those really are your options. They use them like a fuel cell that, ha that helps. But if you want to have long duration activities, you need to be able to create energy either from the sun or from your local materials. And then in terms of the power levels that you're talking about, if you want to get the higher power levels, you essentially need to walk up a chain from very small radioisotopes or solar to more advanced radioisotopes to solar all the way up to fission. So nuclear energy is unique in that it's enabling, it's long duration. In the case of a place like the moon, where you have all those shadows sometimes, or you sometimes have that uh, lunar night, it's not sun dependent. And so you don't necessarily need to be worried about the sun. It has high reliability. 
So it is something that is a valuable option to keep on the table. Now, I'm going to be talking a lot about nuclear. I think there's a lot of advantages of it. But realistically, if we're talking about any sort of lunar space activities, we are always going to want a mix of energy resources. Even if we're doing a nuclear-based lunar base or activity, there's a good role for solar in a lot of applications as well. Um, so you just want to go, always keep in mind that you want a diversified system to give you maximum flexibility. Um, historically, when we talk about space nuclear, again, most of what we think about in space nuclear really is radioisotopes. So now we did have a large number of Soviet fission systems used in Earth orbit uh, during the Cold War. We had one U.S. test reactor that was sent into orbit. But the vast majority of things that have gone to deep space in terms of space nuclear have been plutonium-238 radioisotope systems. They've gone to most locations in our solar system. And in general, um, at this point, if you're going anywhere beyond Jupiter, you almost certainly need a radioisotope system. Even Jupiter is pretty challenging with solar alone. So it's something that has been primarily done by governments. That's changing now. As I mentioned earlier, I work at Xeno. Xeno is developing radioisotope power systems that are designed to be very broadly available hopefully uh, a lot more affordable than those plutonium systems, which are hundreds of millions to maybe up to a billion dollars per system, depending on how you do the math. So we're looking at alternative isotopes, strontium-90, MRE, CM-241, for a variety of applications, particularly looking at lunar surface applications. We won a tipping point last year with NASA to develop an MRE CM Sterling system to provide power and heat on the lunar surface, and able to survive the lunar night. But we're not alone. There's a lot of other companies in the United States and globally right now that are trying to develop commercial space nuclear technologies. In many cases, it's enabled by what's happening on the terrestrial nuclear side, that because of the demands of climate change, because of us wanting to make sure that we can uh, support uh, the, the carbon reduction goals and clean energy goals, we are seeing a very rapid and unprecedented increase in nuclear innovation. Uh, historically, in the United States, we really only had two or three major companies that really did nuclear. Now today, we legitimately have at least a dozen, probably more, depending on how you count it. And for the nuclear context in space, for a fission system, the big thing is that we're now developing what we call high assay, low enriched uranium. Uh, essentially, it's a, a higher form, a higher energy form of uranium that is not restricted in terms of weapons proliferation, like highly enriched uranium, but does have mass benefits to actually get to the point where we can use it for a space application. On the bottom left, Draco, which is a nuclear thermal rocket, it's being developed in partnership with NASA, the Department of Defense, and being led by uh, the commercial private sector. On the right side, you see the Fission Surface Power Project, and we'll talk about a fair bit more. That one is being NASA-led, but it is working with private sector to use their technologies they're developing on Earth to apply them in space. So how do we take these technologies? What do they look like on the moon? So again, the primary initial driver for wanting to use nuclear on the moon is tied to how the lunar night works, how you have these two week long periods of darkness. And then if you get to the poles, how you have those really complex shadows that sometimes some areas might only have 20% sunlight or 30% sunlight, but the temperature swings are very substantial. So when I first saw this chart, it made my drop just drop. When you see the jumps, these are all the different latitudes on the moon. And you can see that the temperatures between lunar night and lunar day almost immediately jump hundreds of degrees in most locations. That's a lot of thermal stress. But then in all of those locations, the coldest temperatures get below 100 degrees Kelvin. Not a lot of things are rated for that. It's a huge challenge to sustain a single presence on the moon. But for this conversation, the one I really want to point to in particular is that blue line at the bottom, the 89 degree latitude. So first of all, the temperatures just on the South Pole in general are very cold. So even though you do have those shadows sometimes, you're still, because you have low inclination sunlight, you're not going to have as much energy and temperature just to keep your spacecraft at a general good operating temperature. But the other thing is right in the middle there, you can, it's hard to see with this graph, it's not my favorite graph design, but right in the middle, there's about five month period where because of that 1.5 degree axial tilt, you actually end up with not getting almost any sunlight for almost all locations on the, the South Pole of the moon or the North Pole. And so that's a period of time where regardless if you can figure out how to survive one lunar night, it's gonna be really hard to survive that winter for that specific pole. So when we're talking about nuclear, this is what we're trying to solve. We want to survive the lunar night. We want to, be able to operate in the lunar night with our spacecraft so we can do things for more than two weeks. And to really illustrate this, there's two missions I think just demonstrate the difference here. So I'm going to start with a solar powered one called Viper. Now this is a really exciting mission of compared to the other one. This one is manifested. It is set to fly either this year or next year. They are using solar in, I think, a, a very cognizant way. It's a, um, about $450, $500 million cost mission. 
And its goal is to explore those permanently shadowed regions to figure out what does the ice look like? So yes, we expect and we have measurements that show that there's some sort of water. We don't necessarily know what how to characterize it in terms of what is its morphology, how does it bound on the regolith? Is it just small layers? Is it really mixed in? And also the quantities. Are there certain areas where there's going to be a sufficient level of co concentration for us to mine? A general rule of thumb is like a 1% concentration. That starts getting economically mineable so we can have that water refueling uh, architecture. Our cross data shows 5.6%. But if we're actually looking at being able to go and mine these areas, we need to know the surface truth. We need something to actually go down there. So Viper is intended to do that. The chart on the right shows its plan. Uh, it's going to go to some really small uh, shadowed regions. It's going to go very briefly in them. It can operate for a little while in the shadowed regions on its batteries, and it's going to come back out. It's going to get a fair amount of ground truth across multiple different types of uh, expected ice concentrations to hopefully clarify what the volatile environment really looks like. How is it going to survive the lunar night? How is it going to survive all those really complex shadows? Because this is near the South Pole. They developed a really good concept of operations that is based around safe havens. Essentially, they found the tallest mountain in the South Pole. And when it's getting close to dark, they're going to go run the rover up that mountain so it can find a spot where it's only dark for three or four days. And its batteries will keep it around and operating for hopefully that period of time. And they can do this a couple times. So that means, though, that their science is pretty limited because they essentially have to do some science activities and then go run up to the safe haven, make sure that they're safe, make sure that they got electricity, hunker down and hibernate, and then come back down and do some science again. And then the end, that four month winter I showed you about, that's gonna kill, probably kill the mission. Now, maybe not, maybe it'll somehow survive four months of very cold, dark temperatures, but that that the mission is inherently limited just because it's only using solar and it's in this really tough environment. Again, I'm a big fan of the mission. Uh, the, the safe havens is a really good a mechanism to get around limitations on operating the South Pole. This is a, a um, zoomed up photo of the South Pole where they essentially identified the areas that qualify as safe havens where they would have enough time that is limited in shadow to be able to operate for some of the time of the year. And you can see that of the ones they identified, half of them were excluded for different reasons like having uh, bad communications profiles, steep slopes. So they really only had a handful of options for where this could go at all. And that kind of limits the science. So. The, the craters that they're going to be looking at, the permanently shadow regions, they're pretty small ones. They can only go a little bit inside of it. They're not going into the deepest, darkest ones where we expect the most exciting volatile deposits are. That brings me to the other rover, Endurance. So Endurance is a, this is not a manifest emission. So just always remember there's a difference between something that's built and operating and is theorized. Uh, but this is a mission that was identified as a priority in the decadal survey. It uses a plutonium radioisotope system like NASA would provide. And because of using that radioisotope system, it has a very different mission profile. This is a mission that is meant to last years. It has two different versions. One goes and actually drops off some samples with astronauts. The other one is a robotic. It's actually a sample return system. It's designed to go over a thousand miles on the surface of the moon, get samples in a bunch of different locations. And it can do that because it has the radioisotope system. So its operations are very different. This top chart actually shows uh, what that looks like. So regardless of the lunar sunlight and the, the shadow conditions, this mission always operates. It's either going to be driving or doing an interval stop to either take small measurements or a deep interval stop to take bigger measurements, but it will always be operating. And so just in terms of its uptime, it's maximizing its uptime over the course of its multi-year mission. And also because of its uh, ability to have this radioisotope system to last many years, at the end of its mission, when it drops off its uh, samples, it can have an extended mission. And we know from the Mars rovers that are nuclear powered, those extended missions can last a very long time. And it's not designed for it, but endurance could actually be used as an ice prospector deep, deep in those permanently shadowed regions in the 2030s. So how does this compare? Viper endurance again. Viper, I'm a huge fan of. It is really ingenious and it's something that we can do right now in the year 2024. Endurance is a little bit further away, about three to five times more expensive, depending on the, the specific architecture. But when you look at the location, Viper is only really doing a small area. That map I showed you earlier was about three kilometers. Its total distance over 100 mission is 12 miles. Endurance can go 100 times more across a much wider area get, and also do sample development. Uh, the safe havens, the hibernation, again, it, it's what makes Viper possible without a radioisotope system. Uh, but it does limit its operational ability to deliver long-term results like endurance could. On the fission side, so that's 
just really shows if we're talking about small robotic systems or distributed architectures or landers on the moon, radio isotopes really help us access the South Pole of the moon. The efficient side is what lets us do higher power and more exciting things like mining the moon and actually getting some of that water, using heat to pull it out of the regolith and use it for refueling. So this specific reactor here is really exciting. It's called Kilopower. It was the first novel reactor developed, designed, and built and operated in the United States in decades. All the way through, we've not actually done that for a, a single reactor in a really long time. This the whole thing only costs about $20 million. It was a really well done experiment. And it really accelerated just the terrestrial focus on nuclear innovation, all those commercial companies I talked about, in addition to the space nuclear side of things. Now, this reactor is about a kilowatt electric. Uh, most radioactive systems are in the tens to the hundreds of watts uh, kind of range. And it was done and led by the Department of Energy and NASA. But it has led to fission surface power, which is NASA's major initiative on this. Now, this is hey, quick, much quick, 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 quick question, yeah. Alex. That previous um, slide you showed, what is the what is the isotope like? What is producing this kilowatt electrical? Is it plutonium? Great. Yep. Great question. This was highly enriched uranium. Really? Uh, yep. So and just, and that's and part of how they were able to enriched uranium and then and what is it is it the alpha emission is it spontaneous fission subcritical what's going on so this was critical fission so this is a full-on fission system with highly enriched oh, uranium yeah i see i think you said it was an rtg okay that's interesting. oh no sorry are you going to talk about the nasa glenn rtg sterling engine not in detail but i'm definitely happy to talk about that after the presentation thank you Sorry for the interruption. So this has led to fission surface power, which is going to the next generation of that fission system. So it's looking to be more than 40 kilowatts electric, potentially a fair bit larger. They are targeting it being deployed in the early 2030s. It was actually just in the appropriations bill. They put a fair amount of money to actually developing this and down selecting. It would be commercially provided. So this is, again, where that high assay loaner uranium opportunity I talked about enables this to happen. But this technology and talking with these companies and looking at it, we can scale this to megawatts relatively easily, especially if we start having super heavy launch vehicles available for lunar deliveries. So how does fission surface power play into space resources? Frankly, it's NASA's actual nominal, but actual plan right now is to use fission surface power for its first space resources pilot system. Now, NASA right now is looking at both polar ice mining, which is what I'm uh, focused on in this presentation, but also just looking at regolith as well. You just take regolith, you can process it, at least the oxygen. But fission surface power is nominally slated to come online to pro provide power for that first pilot system. So it really is about the mining scale side of things. So how do you combine these two threads? So this lunar ice mining we talked about, and then what's happening on the nuclear side of the technologies. The way that I think about this is uh, actually looking at pair technological development. So on the lunar ice side of things, we have, I think, five phases. We have scientific, which is actually really close to Viper. We want to better understand and characterize the resources scientifically so that we can inform prospecting campaigns. And that's where something like an endurance rover would come in. Then we want to demonstrate uh, the initial technologies. And so in many cases, this might just be a technology that demonstrates a specific part of a space resources uh, ice architecture. Then we'll do initial extraction, which probably would be enough to maybe re refuel one lander a year. And then we get to industrial scale extraction, where we can actually start doing large scale lunar ice exports. So this is a, a way to just represent what does a lunar ice mine look like? Uh, it's a flow sheet. So in general, uh, the way that really think about this is that the first two uh, blue sections, you're going to extract the icy regulate, probably with some sort of rover, it's going to go and scoop it. They'll transport it out of the PSR so that you're actually in an area that might have at least some level of sunlight. Again, you want energy diversity, even with nuclear. You want to separate out the ice if you can. Again, we don't fully understand how the ice is mixed with the regolith, but if you can, you might want to be able to separate out most of the non-icy regolith. You want to put it in a processing system, and that's where you actually will then take it out and purify it and get some of those volatiles you don't like, say hydrogen sulfides, potentially be able to separate out some of the carbon-bearing ices if you want the carbon. You'll store it, you'll ship it off the moon. How does this match up with our nuclear technologies that we went over? So first, again, when we're looking at this, we'll have this demonstration phase, so demonstration extraction. We'll want to demonstrate that we can actually extract the icy regolith. And so we have a rover, we can use what we call a radioactive heater unit, just a little heater that keeps the rover alive, still could be battery powered with solar, or a full on radioactive power system where we're having power as well. That can show that we can extract it in the permanently shadowed region. 
We can also just demonstrate this with regolith. If we we're actually able to just show that we can wrap and scoop up the regolith in a non permanently shadowed region, that helps with the technology development as well. We transport this to separation, and this might be an area where we can actually, if it's small scale, just use an RPS to separate out the material. And then we get to processing, and again, processing would probably just be standalone. This is where we could use radioisotope power system or a small scale fission surface power like technology. Then we get to artisanal, our pilot, and this is actually, we're actually starting to run it all the way through. And again, the, the big change here is just that we would connect everything together. We'd almost certainly would need fission surface power for processing, just because there's going to be a lot of heat uh, that you might need to have. And then we get to industrial scale and you might need to have a fission surface power unit for the separation, just because you're producing so much stuff. Uh, you're still going to probably want to have a bunch of rovers using radioisotope systems. You'll go into the PSRs, get your stuff out, transport it. But then the processing side, this is where you're going to want to get to megawatt scale fission surface units. So this kind of comes together in a way that I think is really elegant. So I'll get to the right side in a sec, but if you look at the, the two left, the blue and the purple, the phases of ice mining map up really well to a progressive development of commercial radioisotope and then fission technologies. So we can progressively develop the two technology trees together. At the same time, I'm not focusing on it in this presentation, but nuclear requires a lot of policy, requires a lot of regulation. It's very manageable. We can do that. And the best way to do that is to do it progressively. We can start with uh, practice with just doing small scale systems. We build up norms, standards, eventually leads to guidance and law. That's what allows all of this to come together. And so to conclude, I just want to demonstrate how I think that using nuclear to solve this specific ice mining problem, which again, many countries are interested in the moon because they want to be able to develop the ice for these architects, these lunar uh, water architectures. This is how I see things being different if we can continue to develop the nuclear technologies. So to start, this is a map of the lunar South Pole. This is the peak of eternal light paradigm. It's how everyone's thinking about things now. We need to go to the peaks of eternal light because that's where we can always access solar. And that's how we're going to be able to do any activities here. So this is showing the lunar South Pole. The South Pole is that purple area in the center. It's showing the areas that have the highest level of solar. Those are the brightest areas. So those are the peaks that have 70, 80, maybe 90% solar. And the blue boxes, those are all of the Artemis target landing regions. And you'll notice that all of the ones both in that uh, purple circle and outside, they're all up on rims. They're all in areas where we can get to 70, 80% solar. The, the entire architecture we're looking at for Artemis landings right now is dependent on these peak of eternal lights. But the resources that we're interested in, the water, the volatiles, both for science and commercial purposes, they're in the orange circles. So all those are the permanently shadowed regions, the areas that have the cold temperatures. And so you see that they don't match at all. If we zoom out, we look at the broader South Pole of the moon, that is very much the case. Uh, these regions that we really want to target are often far from where we will be uh, planning to do initial landings. Um, and just for reference, the intuitive machines lander that is the furthest South landing system that we've had yet, landed right at the top of the map. Um, so if we want to get to the best things, we have to land well on the South Pole. It's really hard to land on the South Pole. And we don't really have access to some of those other areas on the South Pole that also have resources we might be able to get a little bit easier access to. But this is where I think there's an inflection. And this is what we can do with nuclear. We shift by being able to access those permanently shadowed regions by being able to use radioisotope systems for rovers, for explorers, be able to use vision systems for processing, potentially for base power. So that we're not focused just on chasing sunlight anymore. We're focused on what we're there for, which is the water resources and potentially the other volatiles as well. All of the white areas here are areas where we expect that there will be surface ice, potentially a fair amount of ice in that first meter that's potentially mineable. And you'll notice again, I think, especially with this photo, that all of the Artemis exploration areas for the first Artemis three mission, all those blue boxes, they're all the areas that do not have resources. They're almost always far away. And you often have to go down a crater with a pretty intense slope. You're going to be really limited in what you can do because you're chasing that sunlight. So this is a different paradigm. And I think it's even more stark when you think beyond just water. Again, if we want to land Starship on the moon, it needs to refuel with methane. So it'll be carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. You want carbon bearing ices, which is the coldest parts of those cold traps, those permanently shadowed regions. So the green on this map, the green corresponds to the coldest areas where we think there would be a fair amount of carbon bearing ices. And you'll see that the brightest green areas are often the farthest away from any of those initial blue landing spots from those permanently lit regions. And so if we want to really access the ice resources, that's what nuclear allows us to do. It expands our ability to 
explore a very small part of the lunar south pole to be able to explore the entire lunar south pole and get to the resources that we need. With that, um, I'll wrap up. Happy to take questions and can, of course, start with the Sterling question. Okay. I have a bunch of questions and maybe other people do too. Yeah. So you don't have to talk about the Sterling thing. That's a thing. And I think that pro program has ended. I'm very interested if you could post some more info about what is Steve doing here? He's, he's shown off again. What is that, Steve? You're muted. You have to unmute, Steve. Steve, you're muted. You're muted. We can't hear you. Steve, we can't hear you. Sorry about that. This, I always have to have show and tell. So this is a spare radio isotopic heater made by Monsanto, of all things. Or snap for the LSEP packages on the moon. It gives you a sense of the size of some of these things. But anyway, uh, without the heat. That's just like a big block of plutonium, right? I hope not. So I'm going to, I just realized I'm going to take it apart and see what's inside because I've never done that. But you guys carry on. Okay, so I, I, look. I'm very jealous. That's really cool. Yeah, wait till you see the rest of his stuff. Okay, first question. You listed on your one of your first slides, you don't have to go back, a list of contributing factors that are enabling this nuclear vision for the moon. But absent from that list of contributing factors was the recent, quote unquote, renaissance in nuclear energy on the Earth. Would you also factor that in? Yeah, so I, I think on the bottom one, I just put space nuclear technologies, but yeah, I would 100% agree with that. That is very closely tied to... Yeah, you dropped out there, Alex. Uh-oh. Does anyone else hear him? I don't, but he's probably going to come back soon. But you were tied closely to that, Creon. I was tied what? Sorry? You would tie the two closely together. We just did a nuclear event at South by Southwest, and... It was absolutely crazy just how much interest we had in that event. And it, it, was, it does seem like there's a bit there? of a renaissance happening, at least for public opinion, it would be interesting. Was Izzy Blomke there? Sorry, I'm back. Welcome back. Uh, all right. Anyway, we can talk about this later, Alison. We should have a call after this if you have time. Right. So look, so I'm a little confused here. On the one hand, you say you want to do methane. Is there any... And, and let me wrap a couple questions into one. If you want to do what, if you want to just use water, you're in trouble on the moon because hyd liquid hydrogen is, not, is hard enough to deal with on the earth and to deal with it on the moon is going to be just nonsense. But, and it's just absurd that NASA has proposed liquid hydrogen for lunar based propellant stored cryogenically for weeks at a, month at a time. But that's another rabbit hole. So you got to get methane. So do we have any idea how much methane is there? And this ties into another related question, which is whether you're talking methane, water, either or both. Um, I guess it has to be both because you need the oxygen, which isn't in the methane. But this stuff, you know, we talk about this ice, ice in these craters, but some of the estimates say that these craters are actually extremely dry by Earth standards. And A, do we have any credible uh, estimates of the con how many kilograms of regolith do we think we're going to have to process to make a kilogram of propellant? Let's put it that way. Yeah, so that's a good question. And that's where it's going to depend on what type of refueling that you're talking about. Just because you, the way that I really think about it is just looking at the stoichiometry that like oxygen from an atomic mass perspective is actually most of the mass of water. The hydrogen is actually only a little bit. And then what you want to think about is the oxygen, the hydrogen, and the carbon, just in terms of the masses involved. And then you can use some energy stuff to put them together in the, the right, right way. But yeah, it's you're going to probably, it's going to depend on the resource potential, but you're going to need to do probably hundreds of kilograms of processing of regular spill, get one kilogram of usable fuel. And that's okay. That's a lot. Okay. So, that, so then that ties into my next question. Uh, which is, so now you need nuclear reactors and rovers and, you know, mining infrastructure and processing infrastructure that can handle hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of tons of regolith. And then you have to make it into propellant and then you have to store the propellant and then you have to get the propellant to somewhere where it's going to actually be used. This sounds extremely costly to me to set up such a thing, whether it's robotic or has humans. It's going to be exp very expensive either way. The question, is this really economically viable? And what is the 
activation barrier? Like what is the upfront cost before you start shipping this so-called cheap propellant to these places? And is the economic return, is there an actual feasible economic return? Are people actually going to, is it like, at what point does it become significantly cheaper than just sending stuff up from earth? And is it worth the upfront costs to do that? Or is this something like, you know, some of these other space infrastructure programs like solar based solar power or space manufacturing or asteroid mining where arguably yeah there's an elect uh, uh, there's the return after you spend 100 billion dollars so therefore it's not going to happen what is your feeling on that yeah, that's a great question vibe? so i think there's many dissertations in the answer but i think the the straightforward way is that Super heavy launch is definitely an enabling factor here, as is the competition in terms of having many different lunar landing providers. Historically, the number of people have been using it's a million dollars per kilogram to go to the surface of the moon. I think that's changing very rapidly. I think we can actually probably get a lot lower already. But when you are looking actually at the overall architecture that you're talking about, it's going to be multi-billion dollar space mines. The Viper rover, just for a small rover, that's again, a $450 million rover. But for the overall space expenditures that we're talking about, that's in the realm of possibility, especially if you do multi units. So the issue with nuclear in general, also with space, is if you do one one-off thing, it's really expensive. If you do a hundred things that are of the same design, it becomes really cheap on a unit basis. And that is going to be the key is by having a large diversified demand source in terms of both commercial and civil interest in lunar activities and lunar propellant, but also really military demand. I think one of the biggest areas that you get you're seeing right now is that be able to have satellites refuel in, say, geostationary orbit using this lunar refueling, that's worth a lot of money to the Space Force or to the other space military bodies around the world. So in terms of money, it's going to be pretty significant. I think it's an open question. The other issue is that if you're talking about something like super heavy launch, it's an enabling factor in that it makes it much cheaper to get to the moon, but it's also your competitive factor because it's cheaper to get stuff there, but it's also much cheaper to get to the area that you're trying to sell stuff. And so it becomes a really big open question. It's cheaper, to get, it's cheaper to get to the area where you want to sell stuff in terms of Delta V. It's not necessarily cheaper to build a lunar launch infrastructure, even if it's low Delta V, to have an Earth launch infrastructure. Maybe at some point they cross over, but the question is how many hundreds of billions does it take to reach that point? I, I think it's a good question. The, the other thing I'll point you to is that I think a lot of people are assuming that if Starship is successful, we'll be launching 10,000 of them a year. I think more practically, there are a lot of limits to our ability to do super heavy launch. I think you can be oh, very I see. successful. So, so it's not just cost. It's if you have a choice between refueling in space and being able to do a mission that otherwise needs 10 and you can't get 10 manifested because there's range constraints, there's other limitations. It, it becomes this much more complex industry than just dollar per, per kilogram as we go from really still small scale launch right now a very large scale launch in a way that we haven't seen before. I see. So you're suggesting that Starship would probably be the lunar launch, lunar ascent vehicle, if you will, that carries this propellant. Yeah, it, it could definitely be the lunar ascent vehicle. And I, I think also just in terms of like how all of these parts start fitting together, there'll just be efficiencies that like, okay, every single part of the value chain, you're going to start having specialization. And so like you might have something that ascends into uh, lunar orbit and then has a transporter that then transports it into the right part of uh, stationary Earth orbit. I think there, there are a lot of issues just in terms of the Earth to space interface that are some cases economic, but are also going to be challenging just as we scale to many launches. Okay, so I have two more quick ones and then we can open it up for everybody. So my following up on what we just you just said, I've heard schemes in the past. It was actually at Steve's office many years ago. I forget who it was who told me this that of a, somehow this lunar propellant uh, production is going to allow us to get fu fuel rockets or satellites for cis-lunar space, geosynchronous, this sort of thing. Is that your vision or is yours a more longer term vision of this is going to allow us to do you know, larger scale operations in the solar system, not just limited to cis lunar space. Because I kind of question if there's enough of a market to for propellant from the moon to help the economics of cis lunar activity. Do we really need that? Are people going to put up the money? Yeah, so I think that there's three realms. I think 
Cislunar, including lunar surface, that's the chicken and egg problem. It, that's where you need to solve this first. And part of it is just the demand to go there in the first place and the need to refuel there. That kind of helps solve it. And that's where I think the, the biggest rub is. But if you can do that, then there will definitely be Earth orbit markets, which are just playing huge in terms of the economic potential there that you start serving. But then I, I really do think if you are able to do this at scale, that's how you get to Mars. I think it is very difficult to assume that all the up mass comes from Earth. If you can do refueling so that our up mass is prioritizing people and complex equipment, that is what lets you get to Mars much easier. If you send up a starship, it refuels and goes to Mars immediately instead of needing to do very complex refueling operations continuously. You just increase the utilization of, I think, the rate limiting factor, which is the Earth to space transition. So are you saying that the starship would go to the moon and refuel there? No, you bring the wherever is best to do a refueling from an energetic perspective that you could potentially do. So it probably is not going to make sense to go all the way to lunar orbit. It's probably going to be some sort of station, some sort of Earth transfer orbit. Depends the time of year. I'm also a non-orbital dynamicist. There's stuff. But you're saying, are you saying that propellant comes from the moon in this case? Yeah, I, I think oh, the carbon, enough. I think, is going to be the hard one. Yeah. But I think in terms of oxygen, for sure. Um, I think hydrogen is an open question just because that really is much more dependent on only water versus other types. But if you're just bringing up your carbon, like that helps the fair amount. But that's also yeah. where, again, the carbon dioxide concentrations are probably the most limiting factor on the moon. They're not huge. That's where I think there's a lot more questions compared to just uh, water ice. Okay, last question, which is just a simple one. Uh, after I would like to get a link from you into the chat on the one kilowatt reactor because that was a that looked like it was a real thing that they actually built i can't believe it um looked like it was like six reactors actually maybe i don't understand but anyway be that as it may when you have nuclear power cooling is always an issue and cooling is notoriously hard in microgravity and in vacuum how are these things going to be cooled is it just going to be giant radiator panels or could they possibly use like geothermal cooling in these craters and circulate stuff into the cold uh yeah, so I think for the early stuff, radiators are pretty straightforward. For radioisotopes, definitely. Fission, if you remember the shot I showed of fission surface power, it has this big fan above it. That's the, just the radiator. If you start talking about megawatt scale fission systems, you're probably going to want to figure out something like some sort of either just massive radiator farms or some sort of geothermal energy exchange. But I think your point is really well taken that Operating in these firmly shattered regions does help out that thermal element a fair amount. And so even if maybe you have your base with your humans and your refueling area is up on the crater rim, it might make sense just to have your fission reactor down in the area where you're doing all this activity precisely for that reason. Cool. Thanks. Who else, have, who else has questions? We have Brian Turner with one that you've answered, but uh, perhaps we can also let Alex chime in. Uh, Brian, if you want to mute. Yeah. Hi, Alex, and um, awesome presentation. Appreciate it. Um, given the challenges with fission and solar on Moon and Mars, um, curious what the theoretical, you know, upper limits are of TGs for the potential of propellant generation. You know, is there any path to potentially get there? Are we, you know, hundreds of kilowatts? Or are we, you know, stuck down in the ones and tens? That's a great question. So that's something that. We as you know, are trying to understand right now, and I think the broader space nuclear sector is we're starting to really reinvigorate radioisotope innovation in general. There are a lot of government agencies and companies that are looking at this issue. It probably from, and this is where electric versus thermal is very important. From a thermal perspective, which is actually what we care about for a lot of this kind of water and other processing, kilowatt thermal is pretty straightforward. So the NASA plutonium market views are kilowatts thermal. Uh, per individual system. If you start getting to say a need for an overall system of tens of kilowatts thermal, the issue that you start running into is terrestrial fuel supply chain. So plutonium is rate limited, like we just will not have enough of it to use for this purpose. But there are a lot of other materials like strontium-90, americium, a bunch of other isotopes that are being investigated that you can get to maybe dozens of kilowatts thermal for that type of industrial use. There's a lot of development that would need to happen to be able to do that. And I think if you look at it from a curve perspective, Anything less than a kilowatt is very clearly radioisotope. Between one to 10 kilowatts is a, on the nuclear side is not a great area. Um, when you start getting to dozens of kilowatts or hundreds of kilowatts, that's really where a reactor is just going to make sense. 
So there is this curve where small stuff, very clearly radioisotope, large stuff, very clearly fission. In the middle, there's a lot of open questions. That's where things like Sterling or other sorts of applications become a big question. All right, I'm going to ask two quick ones from Micah here, and then maybe a rounding off question if we have time. He was asking a long time ago, has there been any research into seeing if there are any clever solutions to nuclear power plants and microgravity vacuum environments that make it easier, cheaper in space than on Earth? <laughs> it's harder. It's a lot harder. <laughs> Just in terms of the size of the systems you're talking about. Most of the systems we're, we're talking about here are one one thousandth of the size of the systems that we would use on Earth. They're really much more complex to handle. That That is one thing, though, that one of the reasons that kilopower worked was because it was highly enriched uranium, which is really straightforward to engineer. Anything that uses lower enriched uranium, including HALU, needs a moderate reactor, and that's where some of the complexity is. There are some things that are in common and help. I think one of the biggest things actually is autonomous operation. A, a space reactor, we will operate it autonomously. We don't do that on Earth right now. And there's a lot of concepts to do that on Earth. And if we can figure that out in space first, it will very clearly benefit Earth, just as our work on the Earth for doing that right now is going to help things out in space. All right, maybe um, a final one from him. Does China or any other nuclear country have a path for private companies to do nuclear R&D without too much cost? I think China's nuclear R&D is all government run. Yep, so that is where I think if you like, look at the two poles right now, the United States is very much heading towards a commercial space nuclear paradigm right now. It, the, it's not even DOE anymore. DOE is focused almost completely on terrestrial innovation. It's the commercial companies driving things in the U.S., other countries you see a mix. So Europe is still largely government, but you're starting to see some commercial companies. Then China is almost entirely uh, government-led right now. So I, th I think if you're talking commercially right now, the U.S. is probably the, the big market to be. We also have the regulatory infrastructure to do this. This is the only country in the world you can launch commercially right now with a space nuclear system. So there, there are advantages there. The other thing I'll just flag on that is that China right now is the only country that has a continuously operating system on the moon. They have a lander that has a radioisotope system. It's been operating for years. So they have a capability right now that we don't necessarily have on the commercial side. That's what a lot of the radioisotopes are focusing on trying to fix right now. But th there is definitely this geopolitical element on space nuclear specifically. China and Russia literally just announced that they're trying to develop a space reactor for lunar purposes. I think Putin said it yesterday. So this is very active in terms of the geopolitical element. It looks oh, like that. From, looks oh, like, Ryan, go for it. It looks like that kilopower crusty reactor. It actually ran. Like it yeah. actually worked. Twenty eight so, hours. Yeah. yeah. So this, you know, unfortunately, and this is a whole other rabbit hole, another talk, another topic. Unfortunately, the U.S. regulatory regime may well be a stumbling block here, which will cause other countries to take the lead. But that's another discussion. Yeah, and um, I will just point. And there's a really good special edition of the Nuclear Technology Journal that was dedicated just to kilopower and was offered by all of the people that did it. And it really walks through the technology, the demonstration ethos, how they're focused on building, and then how they were able to do some, uh, I'll just say, some regulatory magic to get it done quickly. Great. Interesting. We're at time now. Any final words where people can find out more about your work or anything that you want to leave people with? I, again, I think the biggest thing is just recognizing we're at this lunar inflection point. This is a really interesting area. It could just be something that's a brief flash of time or we do some exploration, but I really do think that we're heading towards a possibility of a sustained, sustainable lunar surface presence. And nuclear is going to be key to that. And that requires a lot of work. That requires a lot of general understanding. But it's also a really exciting time because the, the opportunities, if we're successful there, in terms of what we can do in space general, that if we unlock this lunar propellant architecture, I don't think anyone can really say what that does. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was a really fantastic presentation. Learned a lot. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for your great questions. Have a good one. And I hope to see you very soon.